Range Rovers are sleek, brooding icons of luxury, just like your boy. Their styling is timeless and they can go anywhere they want. But one thing I bet you may have not known is that it was designed to break into the American market. And it all started with a Buick engine. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Range Rover. Range Rover, Range Rover, send Jimmy pumps on over. Big thanks to Butcher Box for sponsoring this episode of Up to Speed. Do you like presents? I do. Butcher Box is like getting a present that you send to yourself every month. It's full of my favorite thing in the world. Delicious meat treats, good stuff like grass-fed beef, organic chicken, and heritage pork. Let's take a look at what Meat Santa Monica brought me this month. Salmons, bacons, pork chops, steaks, I'm gonna make tacos with this ground beef. This is a big old chuck roast. Put it in the oven for all day and then eat it later with my girl. For the ultimate barbecue bundle, absolutely free in your first Butcher Box, plus $20 off, go to butcherbox.com slash up to speed. That's two New York strip steaks, baby back ribs, and two LBs of ground beef, free in your first box, plus $20 off at butcherbox.com slash up to speed. Honestly, I'm not even kidding. Hello? Yes, this is my favorite sponsorship we've ever done on this show. The story of the Range Rover begins with the Rover Company in Solohoe, Wolstwickshire, England. The company itself started in 1885 and there's a lot of good stories in between then and now. But we don't have all day, so we're just gonna start with one of the more famous models, the Land Rover. A knockoff of the Willys Jeep, the Land Rover was a huge hit in the agricultural and military markets, but engineers Maurice and Spencer Wilkes were stressed. 1950s England was slowly crawling out of a post-war slump. Have you ever seen pictures of England right after World War II? And the dudes were worried that the basic amenities of the Land Rover weren't enough, so they got their homie, Gordon Bashford, to engineer a concept car that was bigger and more refined than the Land Rover, while remaining just as utilitarian. The new project was dubbed the Road Rover, AKA the 80 inch station wagon. It was a car that would look at home in the city, but could carry a bunch of stuff and be easy to work on. So they kept pushing and pushing the development of the Road Rover before they realized that the car had been in limbo for almost 10 years. Cut to 1963. The Road Rover still isn't in production, but the jabronis at Rover still desperately wanted to add a large utilitarian city car to their line. Meanwhile, another saloon car Rover offered was making bank. The P6 was engineered by Spencer and Maurice's nephew, Charles Spencer. Kings. It wasn't as practical or utilitarian as a Road Rover concept, and it was slightly underpowered, but it slapped and people bought it. The P6 even won European Car of the Year the first year the award was presented. Rover's line of cars was doing well, but they were feeling a pickle of temptation on their little earlobes. Rover yearned to break into the American market. Who could blame them? We're freaking awesome over here. The new Ford Bronco for 1966. A rough, tough, go anywhere, climb anything sports car. A new niche market was emerging in the colonies. Cars like the Ford Bronco, the Jeep Wagoneer, they were doing some loco numbers and the market was growing bigger. You remember from before, how the American Jeep inspired the Land Rover? Well, gosh darn if it didn't happen again. Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, 1965. Bill Martin Hurst is hanging out at Mercury Marine trying to sell Carl Keckhafer Rover diesel engines to use in boats. When he noticed an aluminum engine sitting on the ground. Oh, what's that? Oh, this guy here? It's a V8. I yanked it out of a Buick Skylark, don't you know? I'm gonna put it in a boat, don't you know? Bill Martinhurst thought the motor might be a good solution for the underpowered P6. But would it fit even? He took out his tape measure and found out that it was only one inch longer than the Rover's four cylinder and only 12 pounds heavier. A V8 that's only 12 pounds heavier than a four cylinder? Bill almost crapped his pants and not because of the fried cheese curds he had for lunch. This 
was an excitement papoo. Bill had Carl ship the engine back to England and contacted GM International about licensing, to which they responded, eh, hey, yeah, well, we'll look into the matter. He had an engineer secretly put the V8 into the Rover P6. After a board meeting in London, Bill handed Spen King the keys to the P6 without telling him about the new motor. Kind of like that Adam LZ video where he turbocharges mom's car. You have a turbo on your car now. Ben drove the V8 back to Sully Hall, got out of the car and was like, this is the first Rover I've ever driven that wasn't underpowered. Huzzah! 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 Huzzah, mama! This new aluminum V8 worked great in the P6. But it was perfect for the new Road Rover. I'm talking Elon Musk and Grimes perfect. So they did what anyone would do. They called up a Buick engineer to come and tune the V8. Joe Turley was just about to go to bed when he got the call. I'm so happy you only have 18 more months working at Buick. Then you can retire and we can Hello? Yeah, this is Joe. Who's calling so late, Joe? It's Rover. They want me to come work for them. Don't tell me you said yes, Joe. I'm going to England. I tell you, Clarice, I'm getting too old for this so Turley postponed his retirement and flew to England. There, he used his intimate knowledge of the V8 to bring the power up to 160 Hz, 210 Turk at 2600 RPM with a sexy 10.5 to 1 compression ratio. The Buick V8 was reborn as the Rover V8. With a powerful engine at their disposal, Spen King and Gordon Bashford got to work engineering a practical 4x4 that improved on the Land Rover's design while maintaining the essence of the Road Rover. It had to perform better, be more comfortable, and above all, be more versatile. Their first order of business was to take a Land Rover Series 2 chassis, keep in mind, this is still a decade before the Land Rover had individual model names, and slap some long travel coil springs on it. Immediately, Land Rover traditionalists were pissed because they assumed the ute would get stuck in the mud without all that articulation of the Land Rover's beam axles. But Spen and Bashford and Mr. Land Rover himself, Roger Craithorn, were going to prove them wrong. The first Range Rover prototype named Velar was built in 1967, and over the next couple of years, 40 pre-production vehicles would be built and tested. And in 1970, the production Range Rover finally debuted. And let me tell you, it blew away expectations. It blew them right away. It seemed like a dignified estate car, but it could also tear ass off road and no other car could touch its versatility. <laughs> the Range Rover was so popular, it immediately sold out and customers had to be waitlisted. At the list price of 1,998 pounds, which is about 40,000 US dollars nowadays, it wasn't exactly within a farmer's budget. Fancy city folk who hadn't ever driven in trucks were amazed at how high the seats were. They could finally look down at all the poor people. Immediately, the people at Rover realized that the people who were buying their cars weren't the people who they had in mind originally. It wasn't a utilitarian box that could haul a bale of hay in the back. It was a status symbol. The car won all types of awards and was even featured in the Louvre as an exemplary work of industrial design. This thing was in a freaking museum with the Momo Lisa? Get out of town! A company called British Leyland had bought Rover a few years prior and saw the demand and they started raising the pricing. But despite the hike, people kept scooping them up and the demand only grew bigger. The Range Rover was so unique that they didn't feel the need to update the design at all for a really long time. One reason it wasn't updated was because British Leyland was horrible at managing the company. That all changed when in 1979, Land Rover Limited became its own entity. The original Range Rover had a very basic vinyl interior and plastic dash so you could hose it down after you haul your pigs around in the back. Once they saw what kind of people were actually buying them, bougie London folk, they started tailoring the interior to fit the lifestyle. So they started experimenting with special editions and outsourcing coach builds. The Mondo Verde 
conversion burst onto the scene at the 1980 Geneva Motor Show made by Swiss race car driver and coach builder Peter Mondeverde. This special edition came in five different colors, had leather and tear and AC, and most importantly, it had two more passenger doors. This was significant because for 10 years, the Range Rover was a two-door. Range Rover decided to keep the four-door configuration, which remains a key feature to this day. Other than that, the car stayed basically the same aside from small tweaks. The first gen Range Rover was in production from 1969 to 1994 with very few changes. If you think about it, that's insane. What is it, the 370Z? <laughs> The company was bought by BMW in 1994, and soon after they debuted the second gen Range Rover. The new Range Rover, designated the P38A or Pegasus, had the 3.9 liter V8 from the previous gen, but later got an updated longitudinally mounted 4.6 liter Rover V8 capable of putting out 225 buff jack horsemen. This engine was standard in the HSE or high specification equipment trim level. One notable feature of the second gen Range Rover was its electronic air suspension. It offered automatic height adjustment dependent on the speed of the car. This generation lasted until 2001 when Post Malone turned six years old. The third gen Range Rover debuted in 2002 and initially offered a 4.4 liter BMW engine or a 2.6 liter turbo diesel also from BMW. This gen is when the body style started looking more like the Range Rovers we know of today. It has cleaner lines, more rounded corners, but still maintain the spirit of the classic Range Rover. 2005 marked the first time that Land Rover offered a second Range Rover model. Coincidentally, that was around when Jaguar merged with Land Rover. Coincidence? There's no such thing as a coincidence. The Range Rover Sport started as the Range Rover Stormer concept with a shorter wheelbase and a new supercharged aluminum Jaguar V8. This Gungan put out 390 truly buff horse boys. The Range Rover Evoque debuted in 2011. This subcompact SUV was the first time Range Rover went back to the two-door body. It was also the first Range Rover convertible. The convertible Evoque was and still is the ugliest car ever made. It looks like a bathtub that Donald Duck would drive. Why don't you take your Evoque convertible, go meet up with the Murano convertible, get a horse and live up in the mountains and don't bother anybody. The present gen Range Rover came out in 2012. The new all aluminum monocoque chassis cut down some weight while the new Jaguar derived LRV8 engine bumped up the power, baby. The supercharged V8 puts out 495 horsepower. Sure, most of these Range Rovers are most likely driven around a Macy's parking lot, but it's fun to know that you can go off-road if you wanted to. The Range Rover Velar was released in 2017. This was the first time since the pre-production Range Rover Classic that the name Velar had been used. Only the design of the new Velar couldn't be more different than the Classic. The smoother lines and road-focused abilities of the Velar are meant to usher in a new design language, which started earlier with the Evoque. The two-liter four-banger won't take you off-road, but it will take you to H&M. Hopefully Range Rover will continue to build more cars in the future that make you poo-poo out of excitement and not because you had the fried cheese curds for lunch. Thanks for watching Donut Media. I really mean it, you guys. We're about to hit 2 million subscribers. I can't believe it. We did this together. If you like this video, hit that like button. Check out this episode of my son Nolan's show and check out this episode of my other show, Bumper to Bumper, which airs every Tuesday. Follow me on Instagram, at James Pumphrey. Uh, I'll see you back here every Thursday until the day I die. I love you.